So we have churches in the 21st century who think that they are anointed, but they're not, even though they have the Holy Ghost. Because the cloud has gone east, but the church has gone west. From the front lines, this is The War Room with Pastor Wendy McDonald, guest co-host Pastor Christina Martin, and our special guest, Bishop Larry Gators. And now, War Room, you are the resistance. I just want to say a very big, warm welcome Thank to you. the war room yes, uh, there's you. a war for our thoughts there is a war for our conscience there's a war for our emotions there's a war for every aspect of our life and uh, God's word has an answer and his yes. wisdom will speak to that so as we go into the war room Christine I'm going to ask you to just open for us in prayer <laughs> okay Father God, we just thank you for this amazing Hallelujah. time to come and learn about you, Lord Jesus, and to talk, even though there's thousands of miles, Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter. You're here in our midst, and you're going to direct this conversation. And I thank you as people listen and engage with it, that they will be changed, that people will be set free and delivered, Lord Jesus, that mindsets will change, things yes. that... They Hallelujah. thought that could yes. never be changed will be changed by your hand, Father God, by your blood, Lord Jesus. And just Amen. bless this time. Let it be a fun and enjoyable time in your presence, we pray. Amen. 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 So, Bishop and our title tonight is taken from one of three of your new books, uh, Comprehending the, yeah. the, <laughs> the State of the Human Condition. Yes, ma'am. And uh, so if you'll go just jump right in and explain that to us, because some people's understanding of the human condition is uh, a paradigm shift away from Ooh. what the truth really is. And I know you're big on the truth of what yes. uh, what what the word of God says and the truth about reality and so why don't you just take it away for us uh, uh, uh pastor wendy dr madonna is such a great honor uh to be with you and uh i honor you highly in christ and um i honor um uh, pastor uh christina uh martin i honor her in christ and i absolutely miss my friend um my big brother in Christ, uh, the Honorable Dr. Apostle Neville McDonald, Thank whose you, impact Thank will you. be felt uh, generationally for generations to come. Thank you, uh, so let us go into the mind of God in prayer in yes. Jesus name. Um, and I know that you pray, but uh, allow me to give a quick prayer before we go into sure. um, the word of the Lord. Eternal sure. God, our father in Jesus mighty name. Father God, I know that you don't need me, but I certainly need you. Yes, we do. Open all seven heavens, eastward, yes, northward, southward, and westward. Open every portal that's connected to you, Christ, yes, and to Lord. you alone. And I pray, God, that you will anoint my mind to become the mind of God that I may become both the parchment and the publication of what God is thinking and teach us the application of thy truth. And we will praise you now and forevermore in Jesus name. Amen. Um, Amen. A passage Amen. of scripture and that, you know, comprehending the state of the human condition. And it's a 12 volume series that, um, one of my spiritual daughters in Christ, uh, Dr. Beverly Anderson out of London, England, she is transcribing um, my teachings. And it's now we're about ready to go into book four. Wow. And to your listeners, they can purchase those books by going to globalspiritualrevolutionmedia.com, um, globalspiritualrevolutionmedia.com. And, and we'll click put on, that in the... Yeah. 
Absolutely. So it's, uh, I'm a radical theologian. It's, I'm different. I don't go, (laughs) I don't go, I go against the theological curve. And I've been in ministry for 40 years, uh, full time. I've traveled to over a hundred countries during that protracted period of time. God had asked me 30 years ago, are you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ or are you teaching the gospel that I taught? Wow. So that was a paradigm shift, a sea change in my thinking. So uh, I want us to go to Genesis, to the book of the big so beginnings just, called the just Genesis. Just go back for me. Are you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ or are you? Teaching, teaching the gospel that I taught. That I taught. And I had to ask okay. the Lord, uh, Pastor McDonald, Lord, can you explain that? Because I didn't understand that. Matter of fact, I was on vacation uh, in Jamaica. I was just sitting on the beach and God just spoke to me. He says, number one, you're not on vacation because every time I go somewhere on vacation, they they end up finding out that the bishop is there and I end up preaching some revival or conference. But the Lord says, the body of Christ is preaching the gospel of what they think is my mind. Uh-huh. But they're not teaching the gospel of liberation that I taught. Wow. So we have a body of Christ. Um, the problem that I see as we go back to the book of the beginnings, and and I, I thank God for you, Pastor Wendy, because you're so sensitive to the voice of God, both you and Pastor Christina. Genesis chapter one, verses three and four. Um and the subtopic to this comprehending on um, the state of the human condition would be apostolic graces, Pentecostal places. Apostol- apostolic graces and Pentecostal places. places. You see, we're all in heavenly places in Christ, but we're not occupying the same place in the heavenlies. Because your grace is your place, which becomes your lane. So as we go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the problem that I see uh, as an apostle of grace is that we have a generation of individuals who have the right giftings, but they're occupying the wrong office. And so there's a great distinction between offices and the giftings. Christ did not give the giftings first when when he was on the earth because he was not yet glorified. Uh So he established the offices. So we have a generation, as we go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, who had the right furniture or gifting but they're occupying the wrong office in the building. Wow. Because every office does not have the same square circumference. Yes. So we have people who are in apostleship, but they're not called to that office. Yes. They're there because of insecurity. And we have insecure pastors thinking that they are prophets. Right. So we have the right giftings, but we are not occupying the um, the right office. And so Genesis chapter one, if I can take my time in, in yes, again, please, please. this is powerful. And thank you for your patience because uh, I'm a unorthodox teacher. So Genesis I chapter one, verses three and four. So the word of the Lord says, and God said, now, if you take the word and, and write it from right to left, because Hebrew is written from right to left, you get the term DNA. Yes. So, and God said, or the DNA of God said, let there be light. 
and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. Three words that I want you and I to concentrate on. And God said, and God saw, so. and God divided. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard uh, of the great philosopher um, by the name of Aristotle. Yes. And he wrote in his, one of his great philosophical books, his 10 categories of logic. Now, he came from a place of pain and trauma because he was molested as a child. Goodness. And because of that pain and that trauma, which becomes his drama, it affected, infected his writings. And so there's a saying, the pen is mightier than the sword, but a broken heart of the writer uses the pen as a sword. But he ah. said in his 10 categories of logic that God is a prime mover, but he never explained who moved the mover. He's speaking from a, a threshold of pain and trauma. He said that God is nothing more than an abstract universal principle of being. Yes. He says a God, not the God. Hmm. He says a God, and this is from the threshold of his past, a God who, instead of giving meaning to the universe, is itself in need of the contingency in correlation to itself. Well, Aristotle is wrong because, number one, God needs no one or no thing. Yes. Yeah. I always ask my students, I have a global master class. Uh, on Sundays and Mondays. Now we have uh, a new day and time, Friday, uh, Fridays, 2 p.m. and Mondays with our recap class at 2 p.m. I said, before there was a there, God. There was no there before God. There was no, so somebody said, well, he was out there. What there? <laughs> he was around the corner. What corner? He's down under. What under? Yes. So God is what we call theocentrica. In other words, God is in the center of himself, as himself, never needing to leave himself to become himself, and never needing anyone to affirm who he is. He's God all by himself. So Aristotle is wrong, but he's speaking from a foundation of pain and trauma. Mm -hmm. And I, this is why I, I believe that, and I'm going to say this, this is radical. I'm like Paul. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, it is I, not the Lord speaking. Well, you're a I, radical <laughs> theologian. Oh, I am a biblical John Wick. I am a contract killer. I love it. I am a apostolic assassin, and a Pentecostal mercenary. Yes. So then, uh, I've been invited to speak on a podcast hosted by Joel Osteen. Okay. And I said, are you sure you want me to speak? <laughs> because it's one of his children who loves the bishop's teaching. I was also invited recently to be on Rolling Stones, the Rolling Stone uh, podcast to talk about the disease of communism. So God is in the center of himself, but he's also what we call Theoanthropos. He's the God man. He was 100% God and 100% man. So here's another radical insight. You and I have been taught that this flesh is our natural body. It is not. 
Hmm. Our flesh is the unnaturality of our fallen state. Hmm. Because wow. in Genesis 3, after Adam, the first and last letters of the, of the term Adam is A.M., God created him as the A.M. of the morning. God designed his wife, Eve, to be the P.M. of the evening. And this is why I always say the preachers, it's Adam and Eve and not Adam and Deacon Stevie. <laughs> it's even Adam and I even Ellen Degenerate, another topic for another day. Yes. So comprehending the state of the human condition, here is radical theology. God said, Bishop, I did not design you, nor what you call humanity, to be a homo sapien. Which means you being human is unnatural. I told you I'm radical. Because in oh. Genesis 3 and 6, the serpent uses the term wise. Though we're in the Hebrew Old Testament, but the term wise, according to the Persian text, it means homo sapien. So your natural flesh, what we think is natural, represents the unnaturality of our fallen state. Yes. Because yes. Adam was spirit. Yes, yes, he came from the dust of the ground. But that term dust rabbinically is spirit. But we acquired what we call pigmentation now remember jesus cast out the legion into the herd of swine or pigmentation wow so your skin my skin represents the unnaturality of our fallen state well bishop what is our natural body that part that you can't see in the mirror that is your spirit man your spirit woman so when we talk about comprehending the state of the human condition, the term human means a hybrid. I know this is different theology from what you guys might have heard in the past. So this is not going back to God. This is going back to the dust from whence it came. So who you are is not skin color. People wow, put a premium yeah. on skin color. I'm black, I'm so white. True. No, skin so color or pigmentation is just the coding of your fallen state. Hmm. So Christ came to restore our natural body, the spirit. Now in our text here, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now, remember, God is theocentric. He's in the center of himself. He doesn't need anyone. God doesn't need you and I, but God hath need of us. Yes. God is anthropos. He's the God-man, came in the person of Jesus Christ. So God said, I created creation into creation. God created thought and brought thought into being. Yes. So when we talk about God and his internality, his eternality, it is very important for preachers to first understand who they are mm. in order for them to properly understand what they are which then gives birth to you standing. Oh, so then, good. God is he who is. He who brings being into being. Oh, man, I feel a, uh, a Neville McDonald anointing on me today. <laughs> God is he who brings thought into thinking. So I had a... A fellow theologian here in the city, and we, you know, we talk about once a week, a Nigerian brother, he says, Bishop, what I don't understand 
if Jesus was the Christ and we know that he is, why does history say that he was born in 4 BC before Christ, if he is the Christ? Well, remember, Jesus Christ is theoanthropos. He's, he was 100% man and 100% God. It took Jesus four years, the first four years of his life, to come into his awareness as the Christ. Ah, uh, so the baby Jesus, born in 4 BC. Yes. But it was four years before he became uh, into awareness as the Christ. And let me say this as, as a side point, not to get away from our text in Genesis chapter uh, 1, verses 3 and 4, comprehending the state of the human condition, apostolic um, graces in Pentecostal places. When you and I, and see, there are three born-again degrees of dimensionality. I told you I'm a radical thinker. In John 3, Nicodemus was asking Christ a question that Nicodemus already had the answer. In other words, many times we ask God questions that we already have the answer to. <laughs> Jesus Christ never asked a question with the question. Yes. He always asked the question with the answer contained within the question. Whom do men say that I, circle I, the son of man am, circle am. That's the answer, Beautiful. I am. Beautiful. So Nicodemus said not to, now keep a mental paperclip there in our text in Genesis chapter one, verses three and four, comprehended the state of the human condition. Is that how can a man be born when he is old? Shall he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So here are three degrees of you being born again. I know this is radical. Number one, you're born through your natural birth. What we say, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to, I got to say something radical. God spoke to me right before I came on the air with you guys. And he said, I want you to tell Dr. Wendy McDonald and Pastor uh, Christine Martin, Christina Martin in the church that you've been taught that your natural birth through your mother's womb is natural, but it's unnatural because it's a part of our fallen state. That's the part that people may not understand, but you're born, which the world calls naturally through the seed of your father, through the womb of your mother. That's the first phase. The second phase is, of course, your born-again experience in Christ. Your third born-again experience, his radicalism, just because you're born again, your born-again experience and matriculation doesn't stop, which means every time, as a matter of fact, you guys are being born again right now. Yes. Christina smiling. In other <laughs> words, revelation brings you into a reality, what I call ality. I'll explain what ality means versus reality. Every time God downloads revelation into you, Pastor Wendy and Pastor Martin, you're constantly being born again, again, and again. So God is he who brings light into awareness. God is he who is nothingness. Now stop right there. We're still in Genesis chapter one, verses three and four. So then when I say God is nothingness, he doesn't have mass. Yeah. He's not flesh. He doesn't have a height or a weight. Mm -hmm. You and I have a height a weight in a mass yes. because of our fallen state. God. So God, when we say it's nothing, it's what Peter so Simon said, Lord, we have toyed all the night and have taken nothing. Well, they caught something, but that something was nothingness, the spirit. So God, 
is he who cannot be contained. Oh, yes. Lord Jesus. Ooh, that's good. You know, I've got, I got Trinitarians all the time, preachers, telling me. Can I take my time, guys? Listen. <laughs> take your time. Take, take your time. God, uh, you know, is sending me all these Trinitarian preachers and explaining to them the oneness what, of God. What, what is a Trinitarian preacher? A Trinitarian preacher is a man or a woman who believes that God is not three manifestations, but he's three persons, okay. which is not biblically foundational. The Trinitarian doctrine, uh, as we keep a mental paper clip there in Genesis chapter one, verses three and four, comprehending the state of the human condition, there was a theologian who left the apostolic church by the name of Arius, who then in, uh, at the 325 AD conference in Nicene, Turkey, designed what he calls the Trinitarian doctrine okay. of three persons in the Godhead, which is not biblically true. So, God's word, and this is where we get the term Trinitarian, Arian, from Arius. So when we say God, Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, bodily. we're saying that God is one person, Jesus Christ, but he has three divine manifestations, not persons. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the father of creation. Yes. He's the son in redemption. In other words, when we say sonship, we're talking about the flesh or the body of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's the Holy Ghost in regeneration, the power of God. Three manifestations, not persons, three manifestations of the one person, Jesus Christ. That's the apostolic oneness faith, according to Acts 2. But the Trinitarian doctrine from Arius, which is the doctrine of Arian or Arius, says that there's three persons. Yes. Well, Wendy McDonald is one person, mm -hmm. but she's a pastor. She's the senior pastor. She is a mother. Maybe a grandmother, I don't know that, an yes. aunt, but you're one person. Right. If Pastor McDonald would go to the ocean there, uh, on off to the coast of South Africa, and you take a cup of, of uh, empty, an empty cup, and you dip that empty cup into the sea, you put a lid on it, and you bring it back home. Your children say, oh, that's a cup of water. No, that is the sea uh. contained in the cup. It doesn't diminish the cup, but it enhances the sea. So Jesus Christ is God. And that's why the Trinitarian doctrine is not the truth. So when you talk yeah. about the three degrees of the new birth, it's yeah. like you're born again. Yeah. You are being born again, or you were saved. You are being saved, right. and you shall be saved. You shall be saved. Yes. That's it. You're in the so you are you're saved. You're in the process of being saved, right? And ultimately, you shall be saved. Right. So this born again experience, we're born again in Christ. Right. But your born again experience does not stop. When you were born again, it continues as you are matriculating in Christ, as you are going into stratospheres, stratospheres and dimensions. And that's the part my theologian friend didn't understand until I explained it to him and it blew his mind. And I said, well, he said, Bishop, you say Jesus is God. Well, what was the voice from heaven at the baptism of Jesus? Well, Jesus Christ is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. Yes. So 
Yes, he was contained in the body of Jesus Christ. Right. But he was still on the throne at the same time. How is that? Because that comes by revelation. Yes. That voice was a pre-recorded recording before the foundation of the earth. That's why this has to come by revelation. It has to come by revelation. You cannot contain God in the paradigm of your theology. That's why people say, well, you're radical. Yes, because, you know, and and, and not to get away from Genesis, I'm flowing as the spirit of the Lord gives it to me. I in one of my radical teachings, comprehending the state of the human condition, We've been taught that the anointing is the Holy Ghost. No. Now, remember the cloud which led the children of Israel, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The cloud is the anointing. Yes. The Holy Ghost, who is Christ, was already in the tabernacle of Moses between the two cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant. Right. But the tabernacle could not move until the cloud moved. Wow. Which means we see the anointing is the residue of the Holy Spirit. So we have churches in the 21st century who think that they are anointed, but they're not, even though they have the Holy Ghost. Because the cloud has gone east, but the church has gone west. And do you think the church is in an apostate state in in many places? In many places, the church is in a state of apostasy because we're allowing homosexuality and lesbianism to take over the narrative of the church. That's apostasy. I'm not condemning them as a soul, an individual, but it is a, a, the state of apostasy to allow a government to come in because you want to protect your 501c3 to for you not to teach out against certain sins or against sin. So we've allowed anything and everything to come into Zion uh, because of the love of money. So, yes, the church is in a state, a certain part of the church is in the state of apostasy because it's, you see, you can dwell in Christ, but the question is, is Christ indwelling in you? Wow. Hmm. And, and the problem is we don't know who Christ is because we only know the letter of the law, hmm. but there's no anointing. All That's they right. can say is she came in the car and riding in 10 Hondas, five Suzuki's and bro- in a broken down Kawasaki. <laughs> the, I, I'm not going to preach here. The devil can speak in tongues. You see? But there's no anointing. That's why these seminaries are called cemeteries. We don't (laughs) teach anointing, no revelatory insight. And we are producing a generation, man, I feel an anointing. We're producing a generation of preachers who only want the jelly in the donut but they have no knowledge, Pastor Wendy, how to make the dough. So what is the solution? The solution is to have God-ordained teachers yes. in the seminary. Well, back up. Let me back up a little. The term, we, we have to stop calling it seminary. I think see, I agree the, with you on that one. See, <laughs> the <laughs> church has been Vaticanized. You see, that's why we call ourselves not Christians of the Christian faith. We call ourselves Christianity. Uh. Well, the term anity is a Latin Vulgate word meaning Vaticanization. Hmm. So the term seminary is a Vaticanized term 
that Constantine established in 325 AD as part of the curriculum of the Roman Empire. Mm. So what his goal was, was to bring the Vatican into the apostolic church, right. to bring Trinitarianism, uh, to bring the Vatican order of Constantine. So we got to get rid of this term seminary. And I'm going to say a word, and please forgive me, sisters, what I'm about to say, but I have to teach the truth. The origin of the term seminary is semen. Wow. Forgive me for saying that, but I have to reveal the truth. So yes. we have to be de-Vaticanized. Uh, that, that takes time. So that's the first foundation. The second foundation the second solution to answer your question, um, Pastor Martin, is to make sure that we have God-ordained teachers that know what they're talking about. And we have to know what we're teaching because there's a great difference between, and not to get ahead of the Lord, but there's a great teaching between the words to catch away versus being caught up. So we have to be taught words and phrases. So one, we have to de-Vaticanize the church, okay? And two, we have to have the right leadership who were ordained the right people to teach at the right school. It's, it's very important. So as we move further into Genesis chapter one, verse three, and I keep telling teachers and preachers, stop teaching that God created the light. He did not. God did not create the light. Why would God need to create something that God is? Wow. Oh, I, I feel a McDonald anointing on me today. <laughs> yes. Comprehending the state of the human condition, apostolic graces, Pentecostal places. Why would God need to create something that he is? I tell preachers all the time, don't sell the sun in order to buy a candle. Yes. In other words, apostasy has taken place because we have invited a counterfeit light called illumination mm. or the Illuminati system into ah, Zion. Yes. So let there be, in other words, God, excuse and see, every time I'm about ready to expose the deep state, there's sirens. So God is the light. He is the very essence of his own thinking. Can, can I share this with you guys? Um, I think last week I was teaching on to our students um, concerning understanding what nature is yes that nature represents the essence of what god is thinking it blew their minds so in genesis chapter 1 verse 3 god said let there be a part of my nature to saturate a fallen creation so the six days of creation is not the first six days of creation, it's the first six days of recreation because the Lucifer falls between verses one and two, yes. okay? So, and God said, stop right there. It means God is the first prophet. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, Hope Christian Ooh. Center. Yeah, yes. And God said... God. Jump in any time if, you know, when you letter the Lord, continue to do that, guys. So, <laughs> and God said, which means God is the first prophet. And God saw God is the first seer. Yes. Oh, my Lord. That's good. And God divided. Divided. God is the first mathematician. So God is the first prophet and God said, God is the first seer and God saw. 
and God is the first mathematician, mathematician. and divided. God divided. So God said he is the first prophet. See, Every prophet. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And I said this, I believe the first time I was on the powerful war room and this blows people's minds all the time. Comprehending the state of the human condition. Every seer is a prophet. Yeah. But not every prophet is a seer. Mm. Yes. So if we can matriculate from Genesis chapter one, just keep a place there, a mental place there, okay, in Genesis chapter one, verses three and four, go to first Samuel chapter nine, verse nine. You know, I wish I was there in South Africa with you guys right now. Well, do you need to this get on COVID a plane? Needs to be over, and you can get I, on I, a plane. You know what? I, I listen. I, I said, Lord, give me enough enough money so I can buy a Lair jet. Oh Jesus! Oh, in the name of Jesus! <laughs> or transport me like you did, Philip. I'll come to that. So, that's, First that's, Samuel. That's the better option. Oh, uh, come on now. <laughs> so, <laughs> glorified body, just glorified body. <laughs> so in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, before time in Israel, we'll stop right there, before time, is before time prior to chapter 9, verse 9, is, or is before time, before time began. Here's another radical insight. God did not create time. I got y'all's attention now. Listen. Yes. God did not create time. He has nothing to do with time. Time doesn't come into being until verse 3 of Genesis 1. Wow, I've never seen that. Because of the fall of Lucifer. Wow. Time is what we call an illusion. Allow me to give you an example. Yes. Comprehending the state of the human condition. You say, I will do this, Bishop, tomorrow. Okay? Right. Tomorrow on the 26th, Friday. When we get tomorrow, I ask you, and you say, and I say, what is this? You said today. You see, when you talk about, yes, today. Yes, today, today, and forever. It's a fallacy to God because time is the result of the fall of Lucifer. Yes. God is both internal and eternal. Time is subjugated to God, but God is not subjugated to time. Yes. I'm going to give you another radical revelation. As you keep your mental paper clip there in the text of Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And of course, now we're in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, comprehending the state of the human condition. You think, and I think that this is the year 2021. Well, where did we get this 12-month calendar called the Gregorian calendar? Well, we got it from the fallen angels called Gregories. You see, in Genesis 6, Enoch 6, in June 6, 666, those Nephilims, those watchers, which we call fallen angels, were also called Gregories, who gave to, to the daughters of men the Gregorian calendar. Wow. So this 12-month fallacy that we're going by is demonically given to man. God doesn't go by no 12 month calendar because the name of each month uh, is the name of a certain demon in Roman mythology, like Janus for or January or Februus, Februus for February. So all of the holidays, okay, all of the this this paganistic system. Yes. It's based on the fallacy of time. Time is a man-made entity trying to catch up with an eternal God. Now, here's something that is going to be radical as well. 
Now, I got to tell you, I brought some some cranes and some forklifts today to help you guys pick up your jaws from the floor. Because by the time I get done with you, you're going to be calling me for another war room here. Comprehensive okay. state of the human condition. You see, time is eternity with the beginning. Hmm. Eternity is time without a beginning. Let me say this again. Time is eternity with the beginning. And eternity is time without the beginning. So God doesn't operate in time. Time is a dimensionality that we're living in because of our fallen state. Now, people said, Bishop, I never heard of this before. Well, I told you, I'm John Wick. I'm a radical theologian, okay? So time, so before time in Israel... When a man went to inquire of God, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. Now, how do you spell the word inquire here? I in, and then the term choir. Where inquire means intimacy. I in, inquire, E in, means external. So inquire, I in means worship. Come on, Pastor Christina. And yes. inquire, E-N, means praise, which is external. Wow. Satan does not want us to worship God. Yes. You see, worship is into me see. Mm -hmm. It's intimacy. Worship is internal from the inside out. Praise is external from the outside in. It's not enough just to have a external relationship with Christ. It has to start internally. Yes. So when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, come and let us go to the seer. Yes. For he that, now, if you have the King James Version, anytime you see words italicized, it means there's a spiritual transformation. He that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. What do you mean, Bishop? I'm saying every seer is a prophet, but not every prophet is a seer. A seer is a person who is granted access to see what God sees. Wow. Not from here. Mm -hmm. From here. Yeah. Wow. You see, before the fall of Adam, Adam did not see God from these. He saw God from here. I'm not teaching new age of third. When, when I'm see, this is comprehending the state of the human condition. Pre-fall Adam spoke to God not from here to here. He didn't have a mouth. God didn't breathe into his mouth because he didn't have a mouth. God breathed into his nostrils. Oh, and wow. man became a living soul, a living soul. Or, or a living parchment. In other words, Adam became the publication of God's thinking. Hmm. So God is saying that before Adam's fall, these were closed. This was open. Post fall, Adam, this was closed. These became open. Christ came to close this, but to reopen this. The light of the body is the eye. Mm. I got some cranes for you because your jaws are <laughs> dropping. And so we're talking about comprehending the state of the human condition. So there's a difference. A seer is one who sees what God sees, but a prophet is the one who speaks what the seer has saw yeah. in the heavenlies. Now, the question is, is the seer an office? No. The seer is not in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Because the seer is not an office. It is a tangible place in the anatomy of God's thinking that I can see what's going on in Shanghai, China as we speak. 
Now, people say, well, you're crazy. But see, these are blue pill thinking people who are part of the matrix. OK, yes. and all the time I'm talking about like a dog on, on social media and YouTube. OK, why? Because they don't understand the mantle. So as seer, you guys are seers. You see what God sees. That's not an office, because if it was, it would have been a part of the Ephesians 4 and 11 apostolic government. But the prophet, the office of the prophet is an office. The person themselves is not the office. It is their grace yeah. and their place, which becomes Beautiful. their lane. Beautiful. So people are occupying the wrong lane. So, when we're talking about, and God said, he's the first prophet, and God saw, he's the first seer. Now, how many times, go back to Genesis chapter one, can I take my time, okay? Please now, I'm not going to be here all night like Paul, I, I, but listen. I tell you, Bishop, this is so accurate, because, oh. of course, with Neville having gone to be with the Lord, yes, you know, I've had people phoning Ooh. me and saying to me, well, who do I think I am now? Am I a prophet? Do I think ah. I'm an apostle? What do I think I'm going to do leading the church? You know, yes. and uh, th this is, is helping me so much yes. because the apostolic grace uh. and the place I'm understanding mm. is, is a, a God-given calling. So. Yes. Yes. You see, and, and, and you see, you're speaking under the uh, unction of the un the unction of God's mind right now. That mantle was transferred to you by Dr. Nevelle. Now you're walking in a Joshua generational grace. You see, we're we're in heavenly places, but not. Every individual occupies the same place in the heavenlies, okay? So, and God said, now how many times, oh, I'm excited, jump in any time, guys. <laughs> and God said, well, that's, that's mentioned 10 times in Genesis 1. 10 times. And wow. God said in the King James Version, and God said 10 times, you have 10 fingers and 10 toes. So Genesis 1 is the, is the schematical structure of who we are. So, and God said 10 times, and God saw seven times. Wow. 10 and 7, 17. Wait a minute now. So, we had 12 minor prophetical books. Wow. Plus five major 17. Yeah. Wow. So beautiful. So, God is the first prophet and God is the first seer, and he is the first mathematician. Yes. So 17, that's interesting. So 12 minor prophetical books. Why are they called minor? Not because they have uh, less, um, not just because there's less chapters, but they're called minor because that prophet has a different sound. Minor, they have a different sound or grace that God has given them. Yes. Minor, they have a local or a national anointing, but the major prophet has a sound that's on another degree or level. They have an international anointing. So there's differences, not just between seers and prophets. Every seer is a prophet, but not every prophet is a seer but also there's different types of prophets, okay? You're how, a prophet. do you, how do you see the seer anointing uh, functioning as opposed, because God said ooh. and then he saw. How do you see them functioning together and the seer yes. anointing functioning? You see, the seer anointing functions in three dimensions. The past and God saw. Wow. The present God sees. sees. The future God is seeing. Seeing. Like the anointing, Ooh. anointed past, 
Yeah. Anoint present, anointing the future. So the different functions of the seer that God will see through Pastor Wendy, something that Pastor Christina might not see. Not because pra Pastor Christina uh, is any less than the woman of God, but Pastor Wendy has a different grace yeah. yes. that's been transferred to her. Mm -hmm. You see, this is what we call apostolic succession. Thank you, Holy Spirit, versus prophetical transference. A prophet oh, wow. does not have the ability nor the design to apostolically bring about succession. Only an apostle like Dr. Neville had that authority. Mm -hmm. But he also prophetically transferred the mantle to you, Pastor Wendy, through both apostolic succession, you as an apostle, and prophetical transference, you as a prophet, now your sight has increased. Here's another revelation to, to give an answer to your question. The seer not only sees in three dimensionalities of past, salt, present, see, and future seeing, but the seer also operates in what we call tabernacle site so you have the holy of holies yes. okay mm -hmm. that's what we call insight then you have the inner court that's foresight then you have the outer court that's the oversight okay wow but you've been given the oversight, Pastor Wendy, because you had foresight. But you've been conceived in the inner court of you having foresight because your foundation is through what we call insight. It's sight, but it's from the inside out. So you have insight, foresight, the oversight. But we have a generation of pastors who have been given oversight, but not by God, because they lack insight and foresight. They've been pastoring for 50 years and got 10 people in the church. So for, for those yeah. that pastors that are watching this and they're like, that's me, what do they need to do? Like, that's a great question. How do we become a seer? How do we open ourselves to, to Christ like that? That is a great question. Um, how do we become seers? Well, when you're born again in Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave you and I the utterance. In the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, who is Jesus Christ, is the giver of the gifts. So the seer gifting is in many individuals, but they don't know that mm -hmm. because they don't know who they are. Yeah. You see, there's a difference between a individual versus a person. An individual, oh, oh God, my God, here's another revelation. God never designed us to be an individual. I, that Siapa Lucifer, in divi, to be divided, okay? Vigil, or what we call duality, or you, God never designed us to be an individual. God, God designed us to be a person. Beautiful. How do I become a seer? It is the call of God. Yes. How do I become a prophet? It is the call of God. One doesn't become a seer because Mother Potato Head, who doesn't come to church half the time, told her she's a, she was a seer. Okay. <laughs> You're not called to be an apostle because it took an online course. Yeah. So the call is there on both of you guys. Not just because I see it. No, it's there because your growth in Christ allows you to tap into your giftings. But people who don't know who they are, they know what they are. They don't know who they are. You see, the who-ness of 50 Cent is Curtis Jackson. 50 Cent is what he has become, but it's not who he is. 50 yeah. Cent is the name of a demon. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so in Zion, we have to come to an intimate relationship with Christ in order for us to be revealed the giftings that we have. So that, that seer anointing that you have, Pastor Winnie, that you have, Pastor Christina, you sense God, but you also sense demons because you are walking in the simplicity of God's thought. Wow. This has been an amazing conversation, I, Christina. Crazy. <laughs> just, I mean, I just sense the presence of God speaking to me. Yeah. The revelation that came out of his word, just dramatic and life changing. And, uh, we couldn't get it all in in one I know. session. It's, it's too much. It's like we have to keep watching it even more and more. It's too so much. So we're going to continue next week. Mm -hmm. So please stay tuned and watch next week with us, with Bishop Larry Gavis. He confirmed so many things and just an understanding of the realm of the supernatural. You have to watch. Yeah. So uh, stay with us. God bless you.